everybody. I'm Amy Mobby, Education Manager at Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens. Thanks for joining us tonight for our third Thursday lecture. We're so glad that you could join us for tonight's presentation, Bioluminescence in the Smokies, Nature's Light Show with Dr. Will Kuhn. Thank you to all of our members joining us tonight for your continued support and a big welcome to all of our non-members out there. I think I just saw a chat come in, someone from Scotland. <laughs> Although you could be a member, I don't know that. Um, so I am going to take a moment for those of you who might not be local to share just a little bit about Jenkins with you. So Jenkins Arboretum and Gardens is a 48 acre botanical garden located in the Philadelphia suburbs. We specialize in plants native to the region and are also home to a world class collection of azaleas and rhododendrons. Now that might make you think that spring is the best time to be at Jenkins, but I will say each season is as beautiful as the next. So I know we're pushing into winter. If you are local, please come and visit during the winter because we are open to visitors every day of the year and is always free of an admission fee. We depend on the support of friends like you. So if you enjoy tonight's presentation and wanna support the gardens, we encourage you to make a donation or become a member. Speaking of support, we want to thank Debbie and Alan Dion for generously sponsoring tonight's presentation. So now on to the main event. We're excited to have Dr. Kuhn with us tonight to explore, um, to explore bioluminescence in the Smokies. So Dr. Will Kuhn is the Director of Science and Research at Discover Life in America. Although native to the coastal plains of East Texas, he has lived in or near the Appalachian Mountains for the past 12 years, earning his master's in entomology at Virginia Tech and his PhD in evolutionary biology at Rutgers University in New Jersey. As an entomologist, he's particularly interested in dragonflies and is heavily involved in the Worldwide Dragonfly Association. He enjoys learning a little bit more each day about the magnificent flora and fauna of East Tennessee, especially the Smokies. So at this point, I will turn things over to Dr. Kuhn to share his screen and get us started tonight. As Amy said, uh, I'm Dr. Will Kuhn um, and I work for Discover Life in America in the Smokies. And, um, and so I want to talk to you uh, today about, um, about our organization and our uh, mission in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And then we'll move on to talking a bit about fireflies um, and bioluminescence. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some different species of fireflies and other bioluminescent organisms. And then in the end, um, I just wanna talk for a little while about, um, about some things that you can do in your own backyard to conserve fireflies, um, which will also help a lot, of, uh, a lot of other biodiversity as well. So uh, Discover Life in America is one of four nonprofit partners of Great Smoky Mountains National Park that all kind of work uh, together to make the park a better place. Um, when you think of a national park, you probably think mostly of uh, park staff and maybe some volunteers, but there's also a lot of other supporting players um, in the Smokies and uh, in a lot of other national parks as well. And our mission as an organization is discovering, understanding, and conserving biological diversity. So we are all about uh, learning about biodiversity and sharing that with our community. And as I said, we are in the Smokies. It's a beautiful place if you haven't been here before. Um, just very full of uh, just some beautiful scenery. Um, it is located on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina. And it's about 800 square miles. It's a really huge um, reserve and uh, just a really neat place to be. And it is particularly special for biodiversity and uh, a couple of reasons why that is. There's some really interesting topography here. It's, it's uh, 
pretty mountainous terrain, especially for the East Coast, um, nestled in the Southern Appalachian Mountains with, uh, with semi-low elevation all the way up to several peaks that are above 6,000 feet. And so there's quite a range of uh, habitats in between those. Um, it is also a temperate rainforest. So the upper elevations of the Southern Appalachians get somewhere around, I believe, eight feet of precipitation. So that's a lot of, that's a lot of rain and that fuels um, a lot of productivity in this area. And it's the only temperate rainforest in Eastern North America, which makes it kind of extra special. And that fuels uh, over 2,000 miles of streams, uh, most of which originate in the park. There's only one stream system or stream on the, the far western edge that uh, originates outside the park. So, um, so uh, you get a lot of headwaters as well as kind of developing rivers coming out of the park as well. There's also some really interesting geology. The, um, the rocks, there are rocks in the park that are around a billion years old, and it's thought that uh, the, the Smokies um, is part of, and, and the Southern Appalachians is, um, is one of the oldest mountain ranges, um, is older than the Himalayan, Himalayan mountains and used to be taller than the Himalayan mountains and has slowly over a billion years weathered down and a lot of uh, a lot of the sediment that has weathered from the Smokies and the Southern Appalachians is now uh, the sand of the Gulf Coast. So um, I just think that's a really neat connection uh, from the, the mountains here all the way to the sea. And um, this region, um, so most of Tennessee was, uh, was not glaciated during the, the last glacial maximum. And so that um, kind of allows this area to be sort of a refuge. There's a lot of species that sort of uh, move down this way during this uh, last glaciation period that uh, stayed at the high elevation. So we have some, uh, a lot of high elevation species that are found here. And then next they're found uh, in upper New England or even in Canada. So um, it's a really neat kind of uh, elevational gradient that has to do with this latitudinal gradient. And uh, we also have um, several dozen to almost 80 uh, vegetation communities, depending on how you count them. Um, and each of these has their own uh, kind of different characteristics uh, related to geology and, uh, and other things about the habitat type that fuel different kinds of biodiversity. And so for all these reasons and more, the Smokies is, uh, is extremely biodiverse. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you just how biodiverse it is in just a second. But there are some threats to this biodiversity. Um, we know that, uh, that there's threats of development uh, in gateway communities and, and other places around the park. Um, there's threats from invasive plants and animals, uh, different kinds of insects that have come in the park and are, are killing some of the trees here. Um, threats from air pollution and from nearby cities and um, the, the looming uh, and ever-present threat of climate change. Uh, so this is a photo from the 2016 fire that ravaged through part of the park and uh, some of the gateway communities, including Gatlinburg, um, that killed a bunch of people. And um, we've also had several um, uh, tropical storms that have gone over us this year, um, over, over, you know, great interior part of the, the country that's, uh, just kind of, um, we're expecting more and more of these, uh, these crazy events like this and warming to affect the higher elevations in the park. And so all these threaten, all these things threaten biodiversity. And sort of the, our mantra is that we can't protect a species if we don't know it exists. We have, to, we have to know about it. We have to kind of get to know the life around us on a first name basis in order to actually be able to protect it. So back in, um, 
the late 90s, uh, several park officials um, and uh, researchers and others uh, kind of, you know, came to the conclusion that the Smokies is a really special place and um, but we don't know exactly what is here and um, and we, we can't protect it if we don't know what's here. So they came up with this idea um, originally thought of by ecologist Dan Jansen uh, for this massive biodiversity study called the All Taxa Biodiversity Inventory. And so our organization was founded in 1998 to carry out uh, this ATBI in the Smokies. And so with the ATBI, we seek to answer kind of uh, four main questions. Um, First and foremost, we want to know what species actually live here. Um, and that sounds like a fairly straightforward question, but um, we've spent the last 23 years just trying to answer that. But at the same time, we also want to know where these different organisms live in the park and when are they active? Um, how common or rare are they? Are there things that are uh, endemic to the park, meaning that are only found here or just in this region and nowhere else on earth? Um, and uh, last but not least, and most perhaps most importantly, how do these actually interact with each other? Um, if, if we were to lose uh, one of the, the species here in the park, um, how will that affect sort of the network of species that they're connected to? And so there are several different facets um, of the ATBI. Uh, we conduct our own original biodiversity surveys in the park. Um, this is one of our interns uh, conducting a survey in Cades Cove, this kind of meadowed area in the western side of the park this summer. Um, we also work with researchers who are doing their own projects in the park. Um, some of them are specifically taxonomic, looking at, say, a group of beetles to, to see what um, what species live here. Others are sort of, you know, tackling a, a question, um, what, uh, how does elevational gradients affect uh, uh, biodiversity of a certain group or something like that. And, um, and so we work with them to, um, to help them conduct research, but also as they uh, deposit reports and things like that, we, we glean information, species information from that as well. Um, we also work closely with, uh, with the park staff here at Great Smoky Mountains National Park um, to, uh, to conduct various research projects for inventory and monitoring um, in the park and, uh, and just, uh, you know, stay, um, stay close with them. Um, and we also work with a lot of volunteers. Um, so we have a project where um, that we are trying to promote now called Smokies Most Wanted. And it's uh, basically an effort to get people to use the app iNaturalist in the park. Um, and recently we discovered 77 new park records just from uh, people posting stuff to this iNaturalist app, posting photos of the things they found. And that um, helps us learn more about, not only more about the, uh, the, the species that are already known to the park, but, um, but uh, find, make new discoveries and, and learn about invasive species and things like that. Um, so over the last 23 years, uh, we have more than doubled the number of species known to the park. So uh, before 1998, there were around 9,600 species known to the park, and now there are 21,302. These numbers were just updated uh, about a week ago, uh, except I didn't update the uh, date on the bottom. Anyway, um, over 1,000 of those, 1,044 of those are new to science, meaning that they were first discovered here in the park uh, before being found anywhere else on Earth. And a fair number of those have only been documented in the park. So that's pretty cool. But we think that uh, this 21,000 is a far cry from the, the total biodiversity in the park. We estimate that there's 
60 to 80,000 species here. And we're trying to def, uh, refine this estimate with a, with a separate research project, but we think there's a lot, a uh, long ways to go and, uh, and many more discoveries to be made. Just to give you a little breakdown of what this biodiversity looks like, in, this is in terms of the number of species, um, almost half of the species in the park are insects. Um, and when you add in other uh, arthropods, uh, things like arachnids, particularly mites, um, and other arthropods, that's well over half of the species in the park. Plants are also extremely biodiverse here. Um, there are more trees in the Smokies than there are in all of uh, Europe, which more tree species, I should say, in the park than all of Europe. And there's uh, thousands of different wildflowers and other herbaceous plant species as well. Um, and fungi are also super biodiverse here, including lichens. There's over 900 different kinds of lichens um, but, uh, but quite a few other fungi as well. And we believe that this is actually, uh, fungi are still very underdocumented. There's a lot of additional work to be done. And we think that this number is actually quite a lot higher. And then if you look at the top of the pie, that tiny little sliver that you see is vertebrates, which uh, includes uh, a lot of the things that drive people to come to visit the Smokies, the, the bears, the elk, uh, maybe birds or fish, salamanders, uh, all of those fall into that tiny little sliver of the pie that's, I think, around two to three percent of the park's total biodiversity. Just putting that out there. <laughs> um, if we look just at the arthropods, um, I'm an entomologist, and so I like to, to talk about uh, insects and, and other arthropods. So we're breaking this down a little bit more. Beetles make up 12% of the park's total biodiversity. Beetles are extremely biodiverse here and also uh, elsewhere around the planet. And uh, uh, fireflies are actually a kind of beetle. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but... Um, Flies are also super biodiverse here, uh, butterflies and moths. Ants, bees, and wasps is a group, another group that we think is very uh, underdocumented. We think that uh, particularly some of the, there's a lot of very tiny uh, parasitic wasps that parasitize other kinds of insects. And when you think about the total biodiversity of insects and each of those uh, or many of those species having their own at least one little parasitic wasp or parasitic fly that there's a huge amount of biodiversity uh, there just in the parasite world. So that's pretty cool. But let's get down to fireflies. So um, fireflies, I call them fireflies, but a lot of people, especially in the South, call them lightning bugs. Um, some people call them glowworms. Glowworms gets a little asterisk here because um, there are a few different insect groups um, and a few different life stages from those insect groups that are also called glowworms. So it's a little bit of a, a, a confusing term. But um, fireflies are beetles in the order, the insect order Coleoptera, and they get their own family, Lempiridae. It's got a nice uh, firefly sounding ring to it. In North America, there are 170 different species of fireflies, and uh, I believe over half of those are in the eastern US. Um, where there's a lot more humidity, uh, a lot um, denser forests, and, uh, and other conditions that, that are, um, are good for fireflies. And globally, there are over 2,200 species, and a lot of those fall in the, the tropical region. But there are a lot of temperate fireflies as well. Um, in terms of lifespan, the typical firefly spends actually most of its life as a larva. So the thing that we, um, that we think of as a firefly, the adult stage, um, typically only lasts three to four weeks, depending on the species, whereas they spend, um, also depending on the species, one to two years as a larva. So they start off as an egg stage uh, for a few weeks, then the larval stage, 
like a like a caterpillar um, they uh, or a, a butterfly they have a pupil stage like a cocoon um, that also lasts for a few weeks and then they hatch out as an adult and some adults uh, or some most uh, firefly males look like you would imagine a, a firefly. Um, so they're these winged beetles. But um, in some species, the females can have just uh, look sort of like a normal, typical firefly, but with maybe shorter wings. And in other species, um, like the female that's shown at the bottom left of the screen, um, they can be larviform, meaning that they uh, basically never grow wings. Um, they just grow mature gonads so they can they can make eggs. But um, that's as, as far as they go in life is like a larva. So um, fireflies are afforded chemical protection by um, uh, this chemical in their blood called lucibophagans. It's a protective steroid. And basically when things eat them um, and munch on them, the, a little bit of that, uh, that blood is uh, uh, mixing in with the chewed bits and it tastes bad. It, it, uh, a lot of predators just, uh, just don't like it. And so they, um, they're chemically protected this way. Um, and for this reason, uh, for this reason, there are a lot of other insects um, that mimic fireflies. So here we can see a firefly on the left hand side and then a lot of other insects that mimic them on the right hand side. So a lot of these are beetles, particularly soldier beetles, this one group of beetles, but there's some other groups as well. But there's also uh, a couple of moths here and even a cockroach um, kind of on the left center that mimics fireflies. So, um, so it is apparently, uh, they taste bad enough that, uh, that it is advantageous to mimic a firefly. Um, it reduces your, uh, your getting eaten by a predator. But there are things that do eat fireflies. So there's a lot of other arthropods like spiders and harvestmen, a few different groups of insects that will feed on them. And there are other fireflies. So um, there is a genus of firefly called Photurus where the females uh, have been dubbed femme fatales. So they, um, they can actually mimic the flash pattern of other species around them lure males in um, thinking that they are going to be able to mate with a female and when they arrive the the uh, the femme fatale will uh, will munch on them and in doing so she ingests that um, that uh, chemical protected blood the with the steroids in it and she's actually able to, um, to get chemical protection by doing that, to transfer that chemical protection over to herself and, uh, and therefore be protected as well. So, um, Yeah, so one of the, the characteristics, uh, one of the things that, that people think most with fireflies is that they light up. Um, and this is through a process called bioluminescence. So the way this works in fireflies is um, you have uh, this kind of chemical compound in these special cells in the lantern of fireflies called um, photocytes. And this combination of a chemical called luciferin and luciferase, um, an enzyme and a catalyst, and some energy molecules called ATP, and then oxygen. And uh, all of this creates light. So uh, a firefly uses this oxygen um, to actually turn the light on and off. So when they want to turn the light on, they open their little oxygen, their little air tubes that they use for breathing. And that lets uh, oxygen in this mixture, they light up. And then when they want to turn their light off, they close off those tubes, all the available oxygen burns up and the light goes off. 
And these, uh, the, the lantern part of the um, abdomen also has special properties that allow uh, certain wavelengths of light to go through it. Um, often they'll have this special protect, um, reflective layer on the backside. Um, so if you've ever shined a light on a, on a firefly up close, um, you can see that that lantern really lights up, um, really reflects that light. And because that's because it's uh, specially designed, specially evolved uh, to, to transmit light. So um, why do fireflies actually bioluminesce? Well, so they can, uh, in uh, I believe all species, the larvae, uh, uh, the firefly larvae uh, light up not just the adults. Um, and the larvae, it's thought that they use this, um, uh, they use their light maybe for visual orientation and to warn predators that um, when you eat something that glows, it's gonna taste bad and um, don't do that. Uh, the eggs of some or all species and also the pupae um, can light up. And the adults of many species light up, but not all of them. Um, so adults use their light uh, also possibly for warning predators. Um, as we saw in the case of the femme fatales, uh, fireflies, they can use it to deceive and attract their food, but they also use it for mate recognition, which is maybe what they're, they're most known for. And um, so Fireflies uh, use their light to kind of as like a like a bird song. A songbird uses uh, uses their song. It's this species specific uh, pattern that uh, elicits a response from uh, potential mates, and these can have different shapes. Um, they will have different uh, uh, timing, different flash patterns, um, different sequences of pulses. Um, and in some cases, like the blue ghost, um, there isn't really much of a flash pattern. They just turn their light on and, and fly around and then turn it off. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And so uh, one of the ways we classify fireflies is by the, um, the time of day when they're active. So in the Smokies, there are six different species that don't have lights at all and that are diurnal, meaning that they come out during the day. There's another three species that are crepuscular. That's a fun vocabulary word. Crepuscular meaning that they come out at twilight. And, um, and then there are also nine more species that are known um, that come out at night. So usually uh, 30 to 45 minutes after sunset uh, when it's nice and dark. And so that brings us to a total of uh, um, 19 species that are known for the park um, and several more that are actually suspected to be here as well. So some other thing, some other ways that we uh, distinguish between different firefly species, other than uh, when they're active, is by their if they are going to display their display locations. So there are some species that display high up in the trees, some that you're probably more familiar with that display um, just like right, just a few feet off the ground or even on the ground. Um, and uh, they can also have different light colors. Um, so if you saw in, um, in this chart, uh, there are three different kind of colors of light. And that's because uh, different groups of fireflies, different species of fireflies have slightly different colors. Um, some are more kind of yellow, some are more of a, a greenish color. Um, and the blue ghost uh, actually looks kind of bluish, even though it's not. Um, and also they differentiate in the flash pattern, this kind of species specific flash pattern. And then the other way we tell is through morphology. This means just the physical characteristics. So there are a lot of different, um, or you can distinguish between most firefly genera um, by using the pronotum, this little plate right behind their head that's kind of distinct generally uh, for, for each different genus. But for telling species, it can be very, very difficult. And, um, 
And sometimes, as with a lot of beetle species, the only way we can distinguish them is, uh, is through the use of, as actually by dissecting their genitalia. So the male genitalia is often a character used to distinguish beetle species. Um, but generally, you can use a combination of, uh, of different characters that will help you um, to identify them. So now let's look at a few different um, kind of, uh, I'm gonna highlight some, some fun species um, and not just fireflies, but we'll talk about a few um, non-fireflies as well. So uh, I mentioned that there are diurnal fireflies and these are five of the six of them. So these different species, again, don't have light, at least as adults, um, although the larvae can light up. Um, and they use mostly chemical signals uh, to, to communicate with each other. So if you look at the, the woodland Lucy, this is a, uh, probably a male on the bottom left. Um, he has these long uh, kind of wide plate-like uh, antennae that are used to sense um, uh, different, uh, sense the females. And um, this is a species called the spring treetop flasher, which is very aptly named because it comes out in spring and it flashes from the treetops. Um, so this is actually one of the first uh, uh, flashing species that uh, you'll see in most of the eastern U.S. And um, it's actually kind of fun because you get a sort of a little preview that it's that it's coming out um, beforehand. So the larvae of the species, and there's a larva on the, the right side here, uh, will crawl up trees and pupate on the sides of trees in late winter and early spring. And then um, a few weeks later, the adult will emerge from the, the, the pupa. And uh, this is late March to early May in our area. And they'll start to flash high in the trees. Um, and again, it's, it's uh, in some, sometimes it can seem extremely early, um, you know, it's still kind of cool weather. Um, and then they last through July. So they last for a good part of the uh, into the summer. And they'll start flashing, uh, they're, they're fully nocturnal, so they usually start flashing 45 to 90 minutes uh, past sunset. And they like um, deciduous uh, or mixed pine forests. Um, and again, they flash from the treetops, this kind of constant single pulse that flashes on and off. This is a species that uh, you're probably most familiar with. Um, it's a very, very common firefly called the J-stroke, the Big Dipper, or sometimes called the Evening Firefly, Photinus pyralis. Um, and this is a species that is known uh, to come out at dusk, and it really likes kind of open fields. Uh, it, it's one of the species that thrives on lawns. Um, uh, because it likes these kind of open habitats. And uh, you usually find these uh, throughout the summer, uh, peaking in mid-June to early July. And they're called the J-stroke because the males uh, have this kind of uh, J-shaped flash pattern. So they'll, um, they'll turn on their light and then they'll sort of streak up and over and it creates in these long exposure images sort of a little swoop, like a Nike swoosh or a, a J. This is one of my favorite fireflies. This is the blue ghost, uh, Falsus reticulata. And um, this species is, I don't believe it's found up in Pennsylvania. Um, it, gets as far as maybe Maryland or so, um, and is found throughout the, uh, the southeastern US. And in our area, it has two peaks. So it comes out in April and May, and then again in June through July. And it's fully nocturnal. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty wide ranging as far as habitat goes. 
And this is a sexually dimorphic species. So as I was, as I was talking about before, um, the males of the species look more like a typical firefly and the females uh, are larviform, meaning that they, this is a picture of her on the right. This is, uh, she never grows wings, uh, but she does have these cool little light spots on her back. So the males of this species uh, can fly around. They're very tiny, about the size of, uh, maybe a little smaller than a, about the size of a grain of rice. And they turn on their light and they streak across and they're usually flying around kind of in dense vegetation. So you see this little dim kind of uh, lantern, almost very ghostly um, flying around that's sort of blinking in and out as it flies under leaves and things. Um, and then it turns its light off. And then a few seconds later, you see it going and they're very erratic too. They're, they're bouncing around and getting caught in air currents and just really fun to watch. Um, and when you, uh, on certain nights, you just get this peak, this, this gorgeous peak of light. Um, so this was taken last year in the park and this is the most spectacular display that I've ever seen um, where there were hundreds of individual males all kind of hovering over the ground and you can even see how they sort of go down over the trail and then uh, slope back up into the forest on the right and left and uh, it's just really beautiful. So they're called blue ghosts because they have this uh, this tiny dim light and there's kind of a trick of our vision where uh, dim dim light in this sort of yellow green wavelength uh, tends to shift over a little bit and we perceive it as more of kind of a blue, a whitish blue color. Um, but if you look at one up close or if you look at a female up close, um, there it's green. And this is a species that uh, brings lots of people to the Smokies every year. Um, it's uh, the famous synchronous firefly, Photinus carolinus. Um, it is only out for a short period of time, um, which is one of the things that makes it so exciting to see because you get thousands of individuals that come out at, uh, for just a, a couple week period from late May uh, to mid June. And that, that time period kind of shifts around from year to year, depending on the weather. Uh, they're also fully nocturnal. So they, they come out starting about 30 minutes after sunset, but they usually peak around 9.45 or 10. Um, and they like this particular kind of habitat uh, called an open cove hardwood forest and a particular envelope of uh, elevation, um, kind of mid to high elevation, starting at 1400 feet. And the uh, male flash pattern, um, so females are, are more or less stationary on the ground, um, and the, the males are flying around flashing to females, and they, uh, the male flash pattern will be a series of pulses, so five to eight or so pulses, one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe, and then they'll stop and pause. And then a few seconds later, there's another flash, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they stop. And this isn't that exciting when you just see one individual, although they're very easy to pick out uh, this species particular flash pattern uh, among any other fireflies. But when you get a bunch of them, as the night goes on, they start to sync up and you get this really incredible display of, uh, of a bunch of kind of crazy flashing, but then they all go dark at the same time. And then all of a sudden the forest is very quiet and you feel like your, your, your eyes, you've been blinded a little bit. And then they're all flashing and flashing and flashing at the same time. And then they all go dark. And it just makes for a really, the, the, um, the contrast between this absolute darkness and then this crazy flashing on, uh, on, um, on heavy display nights is just amazing.
So this is what that looks like. Um, and you can see there's a few different examples here of those flash trains, those series of pulses. So over here on the right, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven or so pulses kind of in a train. And then uh, he went silent. And so you can see a bunch of those and you can see that they're kind of more of a yellow color. But you can also see in mixed around here, the little streaks are blue ghosts. So blue ghost and uh, synchronous fireflies um, live, or their habitats overlap. Blue ghosts are a little bit less picky about their habitat and can be found in a wider area. But, uh, but usually when you find synchronous fireflies, you can also find blue ghosts. And um, this, uh, the, the peak of their uh, synchronous activity, um, which again only lasts for about two weeks, um, kind of bounces around from year to year. Um, you can see as early as, let's see, May 26th or 27th, and as late as June 21st. Um, but in general, over the past uh, couple of decades, this um, their peak display date is getting earlier and earlier and earlier. And we think this is because of uh, climate change that the, the climate is, um, their, their habitat is warming up a little bit. They're dependent on temperature um, for their development. And so if it's warmer earlier in the year, then they're gonna develop faster. And that means that they'll come out faster. And you might ask, why do they actually synchronize? So synchrony is fairly rare among fireflies, although uh, there's a little asterisk there that I'll address in a minute. Um, but we think that um, uh, synchronous fireflies, their, their females need a, uh, will not respond unless they have kind of a, a, a big show, a, a heavy stimulus um, of, uh, of you know, bright lights. Um, of males displaying. They won't, they don't usually uh, react to just one or a few males displaying. Um, but because you have so many individuals coming out, uh, the stage is, is pretty crowded. And this is probably kind of a practical solution uh, to this, um, the fact that so many individuals come out at the same time in that you have males that are all flashing. And then during that dark period of darkness, in the middle of that is when a female will flash back just a couple of little flashes and she's kind of hunkered down, hidden often among vegetation, among the leaves. And she kind of aims her light just for whatever the, the sexiest male that she sees around her. And then, uh, and then she goes quiet and then the males start to flash again and then they all go quiet and then she'll flash to her, her, uh, her suitor to be. And, uh, and that's how they find each other. But there are some other synchronous uh, species, um, one in the US that's known, the snappy single sink. I love all these, uh, these um, uh, common names are from uh, Lynn Faust's book that I'll introduce in a minute here. Um, Photurus frontalis, and this is a species that's found in the southeastern uh, US. I don't believe it's up in Pennsylvania, or at least known there yet, um, but it does also synchronize its flash. Um, and instead of having these kind of flash trains, it just all the individuals eventually start to flash together. Um, in just a series of pulses, on and off pulses. And then there's another species, which I believe was one of the first documented synchronous fireflies, uh, Teropteryx tenor, that's found in Southeast Asia. And it also synchronizes a little bit differently. So individual males will hang out on the tops of, um, of bushes and will all synchronize together. And it looks like, uh, like those Christmas lights that have a little timer in them that are flashing on and off all together. I've heard it's spectacular. Um, and uh, one other group of fireflies. So the genus Photurus, which if you remember are the, femme, the females of the femme fatales, 
Um, there are quite a number of species within this genus, and they're mostly really hard to tell apart. You can tell some species by their, their characteristic flash pattern, but um, in general, they all kind of look very similar when you actually see the firefly in hand. And a lot of their flash, flash patterns can be similar. And they're also highly variable. So even within a species, uh, depending on like um, uh, they will get agitated and do a certain flash pattern. Or if you remember that the females are mimicking other species flash patterns. And so uh, that can make for extra confusion when trying to ID them. And uh, even in an individual, um, uh, they, can, they can kind of change their flash uh, very quickly. And so it just makes for a lot of confusion. Um, but generally these species are found, uh, uh, they're species that are found throughout the summer. Um, some, some are found just for a short window of time, but throughout the summer you have some kind of Voturis. Um, I believe they all tend are, are nocturnal. And uh, some of them prefer kind of open meadows. Uh, some of them like more kind of closed forest, like the synchronous fireflies. Uh, some of them display high up in trees and others like kind of to be low in uh, on vegetation as well. So there's a lot of variability here. But here's one example of them. Um, this is the uh, species that's been dubbed the Christmas lights, or we call them the paparazzi fireflies, Voturis tremulans. And we find these in a particular field um, every year, and uh, you get this just incredible display of a bunch of these very bright uh, fireflies that are all just kind of flashing on and off randomly. Um, and it looks like, it reminds me of like a, um, a uh, an arena where you have uh, people with uh, you know taking flash photography um, because you have all these just like flashes all around you and it's really really spectacular to see on a good night. Um, so a few other non-firefly species. This is a fly, uh, not a firefly, a true fly. It's called the fox firefly or dismal lights, uh, named after the dismal swamp in, um, in Alabama, or Felia fultoni. It's a type of fungus gnat, which doesn't sound that exciting. Here's the adult that you can see on the bottom left here. Uh, but the larva is the star of the show. The larva uh, glows from both ends, so the, the, the head end and also the tail end, and it glows blue, and it's actually the bluest uh, color um, created by any kind of insect. Um, and it's just really spectacular to see. It's kind of dim and a little bit hard to see, um, but they really like these mossy, you find the larvae in mossy seeps and uh, stream banks. And I don't know if there's a whole lot known about their uh, behavior, like how long they light up, um, whether they leave their light on just all night, um, when exactly they, we always find them uh, in late May, early June when we're looking at synchronous fireflies, but, um, but I don't know if they're out uh, longer than that. I'm not really sure. But uh, something cool about them is the reason that these larvae light up is that they're actually predaceous on other insects. So if you can barely make out on the right side of this uh, top right photo, um, this is a larva chewing on what appears to be maybe a caddisfly, some other kind of uh, insect. And so they spin a little silken web, and you can kind of see these little silken threads um, in, a, uh, in and amongst moss or rocks. And then they turn their light on behind that, and that draws in some of these tiny little insects that they then feed on. And um, when you get uh, a good display of them, uh, it can be just really spectacular. But they are kind of dim, and so you have to really let your eyes you have to be in a very dark place to be able to see them. Um, otherwise, just artificial light drowns them out. 
And this is another species. This is a different kind of beetle in a different family called Fingotidae. Um, and these are called railroad worms uh, or sometimes called glowworms. Um, and there are a couple of species in the genus Fingodes. And these both are also sexually dimorphic. So the males look uh, like a more typical beetle, uh, this kind of beetle looking guy here. So they have these big frilly antennae that they use to smell out chemicals uh, wafting out from the females and they can fly around. Um, the larvae look kind of like a little grub here and the females are also larviform. So this big grub uh, looking woman here is a, um, is a Fingotes female and she is much bigger than the males. The males are a little tiny compared to these big females. Um, but both the larvae and the adult females uh, glow, the males do not. And they can be spectacular to find, uh, especially when your eyes are ni nice and, and uh, dark adjusted. Uh, to find one of these in the wild is just so cool. Um, so they have this, both the larvae and the adults have this um, uh, series of um, uh, lights down their back, little stripes, and the larvae can have also stripes going down uh, vertically down their back. And it looks kind of like a railroad crossing. They're just really, really neat to see. And they're apparently fairly common. You can find them, I've heard, in wood piles. Um, uh, the females uh, like to hang out in wood piles because they feed on, the larvae and the females feed on um, uh, millipedes. And so you can find a lot of millipedes and, and kind of rotting wood. And um, yeah, so I've never found one in my backyard, but I would love to. So they're nocturnal, uh, lighting up around an hour after sunset and continuing uh, to midnight. And a couple of other, uh, a couple of fungus species. So um, there is this uh, Pinellus uh, mushroom um, that is found throughout the Eastern US that, uh, that glows dimly, but does glow. Um, to get a photo like this, you have to take a nice long exposure. Um, and then there's another species called the um, jack-o'-lantern mushrooms uh, that also glows. And I think the coolest thing about this is that um, these are the fruiting bodies that you're seeing, uh, but the, the most of the fungus is actually this series of, um, of little uh, mycelia, almost like the roots of the fungus that are, uh, are um, embedded in rotting wood, and those can actually glow. So here we have on the left uh, a uh, cross cut of a piece of wood, and on the right that same piece of wood uh, in the darkness, and you can actually see the mycelia glowing. So um, this can be, this is called foxfire, or is uh, sometimes called foxfire, and it can take the form of whatever. So if there's like a big uh, dead but standing log, um, sometimes you'll see the whole log glowing um, brightly from this, these uh, mycelia. I just think that's really cool. So um, in terms of bioluminescence, there's so much more to discover. Um, the Photurus, the Femme Fatales that I was talking about, there are something like 25 or so species known in the US or named in the US and uh, the same amount at least that are known to be new species but haven't actually been named. So. Um, are waiting to be described as species. And there's likely to be plenty more other species that just we just don't know about. And uh, lots of other bioluminescent organisms as well that we just don't see because, uh, partic particularly because of uh, the artificial light that we are um, want to, to shine around us.
So let's quickly talk about uh, firefly conservation and some things that you can do in your own backyard to, to help fireflies. This is my backyard and my experimentation with uh, some uh, interval and long exposure shots last year. And if you remember this species right here with the little swoop is the J stroke or Big Dipper firefly. So uh, things that fireflies need. So they need shelter, and these, these are pretty, uh, pretty universal to lots of organisms, but fireflies in particular. Um, so they need shelter, which in this case is untrampled habitat, because um, the, the larvae are crawling around in the, the leaf litter on the ground. Um, they need some ground cover, and they are prone to dry out, so they need kind of uh, uh, moisture and, and humidity. They need a food source, so most firefly larvae eat um, snails, slugs, earthworms, and soft-bodied insects, um, and so they need uh, to have this food source around. And for species that use uh, uh, flash communication, they need darkness um, that's free from artificial light. And so some things that you can do to help are to for one, provide unmowed patches of lawns uh, or just totally forgo mowing your backyard. This is, this is good for not only fireflies, but lots of other pollinating insects, as well as birds and other animals. Um, and it's just really beautiful and less work. This is um, my, uh, what I call my native meadow in the backyard that I started a few years ago. Um, at a time of year when there's lots of goldenrod out. And it's just been such a pleasure to, to go back there and, and see every year what new things come to the meadow. Um, you can also uh, eliminate or uh, reduce or eliminate the use of pesticides, herbicides, um, and uh, pesticides in particular um, can affect not only firefly larvae, but also their food source. So other insects, um, other arthropods and invertebrates. Um, and herbicides are also thought to, um, thought to have a negative effect on them as well um, through kind of indirect effects. Um, another thing you do to provide moisture is to leave the leaves to uh, when when leaves fall, um, they uh, and and um, uh, they provide this nice kind of mulch layer that's free um, that uh, that keeps the moisture high at the ground level, um, but they also decompose and all the nutrients held in those leaves gets taken back up into the soil and enriches your soil as well. So it's like uh, mulch and fertilizer in one and it's free. Um, you can also help by planting native plants and to, uh, if you uh, really wanna get into it, you can take out some of, some or all the non-natives in your yard as well. So non-native plants can take up kind of valuable uh, ecological space that, um, uh, that native plants do a better job of providing. So native plants uh, provide food for caterpillars, um, which in turn provide food for birds and things like that, uh, as well as food for pollinators and, and other organisms, um, including firefly larvae food, um, and, uh, and just provides better habitat for firefly larvae. Um, and by the way, there's a, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Native Plant Society has a lot of really great information about native plants um, in Pennsylvania. You can also provide a water feature, um, like a, a pond or even just kind of a marsh um, that will, uh, or even just a, a bird bath or dripper that will uh, bring up, uh, uh, add moisture to your backyard, to your, to your yard. And you can also reduce or even eliminate the use of outdoor lighting. So this artificial lighting looks really nice. It looks very nice in this picture on the left. Um, but 
a lot of times it's really unnecessary. Um, we tend to kind of overuse artificial lights. And so if you just turn those off when you're not outside or set them on a, um, on a motion sensor or something like that, um, that can really help not only, uh, not only fireflies, but other organisms like moths and, uh, and bats and things like that that are, that are out at night. And this is just an aside, but when you are viewing fireflies in your own backyard or anywhere else, um, you do, it helps to limit the use of flashlights. Um, this, uh, you know, your flashlight, your artificial lighting can, can interrupt their mating display. Um, and if you do need to use a light, uh, you can use a red filter, like a nice piece of red cellophane um, that you can just uh, attach to the end of your flashlight and keep it pointed toward the ground so you're not blinding any fireflies or anybody else that's viewing, viewing them. Um, and that will also help to, to, uh, for you to keep your night vision. Um, also limit the use of bug spray and limit smoking. Both of these things kind of create a little cloud around you that can that can affect negatively affect the fireflies. Um, and you can also advocate for green spaces in your area. So this is a stormwater park um, in uh, not too far from my house that actually catches the runoff from. Um, from a suburban community that you can just barely make out the houses in the uh, in the back of that photo, but um, all that water comes in and there's all these native plants that soak it up and mitigate it and prevent it from just rushing into a nearby stream system. Um, but this is also looks like it would uh, be a really great firefly habitat. I only recently discovered it, but I cannot wait to look at this during firefly season to see what all species are there. So just to review, um, leaving uh, unmowed patches of lawn, nixing your uh, pesticides and herbicides, leaving the leaves down and planting natives, uh, providing some kind of water feature, uh, reducing outdoor lighting and advocating for green spaces. And these are things that again, will not only help fireflies, but lots of other um, boost the, the lots of other biodiversity um, in your area, in your own backyard. So um, here are a couple of uh, resources if you want to learn more about fireflies. There's a really great book um, that I alluded to earlier um, that is my go-to field guide for fireflies by Lynn Faust called Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs. And I use this for a lot of the information uh, in this presentation. Um, and then on the right, there's a, there's a really great um, guide by the Xerxes Society on cons uh, conserving fireflies in North America. And some other really great books as well, including The Firefly Experience, which is like a coffee table book with all these beautiful photos from Redeem Schreiber, some of which I use in this presentation. And um, if you want some other resources related to uh, kind of uh, enlivening the, the biodiversity, your local biodiversity, um, there's a really great book by Doug Tallamy um, called Bringing Nature Home. And he has a couple of other books related to this about uh, planting natives and, uh, and other things like that, other ways that you can boost biodiversity. And again, the Pennsylvania Native Plant Society has some really great resources. Xerxes Society um, for Invertebrate Conservation, really great resources. The National Wildlife Federation has a really neat program where you can certify your yard to be wildlife friendly. And then uh, my favorite app on my phone is called iNaturalist, and I use it to, uh, to take pictures of all the kinds of plants and animals that I find in my yard and the Smokies all over the place. Um, and uh, it helps you to ID them and kind of you can sort of keep a checklist of what you found and other people will help you uh, learn more about them. And it's just a really, if you're gonna have one app on your phone, I highly recommend that. It's free, it's run by a nonprofit, it's totally great.
So with that, um, I do just want to thank uh, Redeem Schreiber, Abbott Nature Photography, and Alex Wild for, uh, among others, for letting me use their really great photos. You can find out more about Discover Life in America at dlia.org, and we're also on lots of social media channels. And I am happy to take questions about fireflies or bioluminescence or the Smokies, all of that. Thank you so much, Will. That was awesome. <laughs> So if you would want to go ahead um, and stop sharing your screen, there we go. Wonderful. So I did want to just read something from a chat before we move on into our questions. And I see that people have already started populating questions. Uh, so thank you. Continue to do that. Um, someone had mentioned that they have worked with Orphelia Fultonia. Fult oh, cool. I don't, I don't know if Fultonia is right because that would be two eyes, but That's okay. and watch, watch them glow until 1 a.m. I think they will glow until it gets too light out. Also, if one leaves a light on for more than 15 minutes when they're captured, they will turn off their light and not turn it back on. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah, so they're, they're kind of picky. Yes. And um, while you were speaking, uh, it, I was reminded that the Pennsylvania state insect is actually a firefly. And I it should looks, have included that. Yeah, <laughs> and I wrote I it down. It, it is um, Photurus, which was the femme fatale that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, Photurus pennsylvanica. Ah, well, so, there you go. There we go. Well, All excellent. Right. Yeah, here we go. All right, so we have some questions. Um, the first is about, ooh, we get to play fun Latin games tonight. So um, Lampyris nuticula, we have here in Scotland, do not flash, instead they continuously glow. Does this mean that they do not have the ability to control the oxygen intake to switch on and off their light in the same way? That's a good question. Um, I'd say it more has to do with just their, um, their sexual signaling. Um, so some species like the, um, the blue ghost females uh, will just leave, she leaves her lights on the whole night. Um, and I think it's just kind of a species specific thing. It's possible that uh, they don't have as much uh, like the, the muscles or whatever it is that, that helps them to open their, their oxygen tubes um, have kind of uh, degraded over, over evolutionary time um, as part of that. Uh, but that's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure. All right. So you spoke a little bit about um, diurnal fireflies. Mm -hmm. The question is, do diurnal fireflies have bioluminescence? So yes and no. Uh, yes, they can bioluminate. They do, do still uh, have the ability to bioluminesce uh, as uh, larvae and possibly other life stages, eggs and pupa, but as adults, they don't. Um, in fact, they uh, don't even have like a, a lantern, um, mm. instead using chemical cues. Let's see. All right, one question here is, what is the minimum and maximum temperature range for fireflies? <laughs> Maybe we'll start there. <laughs> um, Let's see. And do they need moisture for all their life stages? Um, yeah. They, let's see. So they live, tend to live in more moist environments, but there are some exceptions to this. There are um, some, a lot of uh, fireflies uh, in the Western US that live in um, kind of uh, particular little pockets of, of certain habitat. They're not quite as widespread. Um, and I believe there are some that can withstand a little bit more arid environments, but they still need some kind of moisture. As far as the minimum and maximum temperature range, I do not know, although most species uh, and most species of insects in general uh, aren't really active below about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but as far as the maximum, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Sure. 
All right. Where are the impossible areas in the world that we can't find any fireflies? You know, like some plants just can't survive in certain planting zones. So that's a good question. Um, I know some of the really high or low latitudes, I think there are no fireflies, but I don't know specifically. <laughs> I can't point sure. out specific places, unfortunately. That's a really good question though. Ah, can humans raise fireflies like yeah. honeybees? I would love to raise fireflies. I don't know. I think there's probably been uh, very limited kind of rearing um, for research studies. Um, but as far as I know, there's no, there hasn't been any kind of uh, mass rearing. And I would imagine that some companies have tried because um, Firefly, the, uh, the chemicals that, that let them glow have been used uh, for uh, lots of research on like um, cancer and things like that, uh, that they create those proteins. Um, it's like green fluorescent proteins that are found in certain kinds of uh, uh, jellyfish and stuff um, that have been used to like tag different cancer cells and things like that. So as part of this research, um, there were uh, decades ago, like concerted efforts for them to collect this chemical uh, so they could study it. And so they, uh, there's some really great, um, there's more information about this in, in Lynn Faust's book, but there's, um, there were some campaigns for like, uh, for school children um, to bring it, to collect all the fireflies they could bring them in in a jar and like researchers would pay them like a penny per firefly or something um, to, uh, to, to, so they could take them for, for uh, research. So I would imagine that uh, the companies behind that would have tried to, uh, to, to find a way of kind of mass rearing at least some species, but that's a, that's a good yeah. question too. <laughs> All right. Do heavily polluted areas affect the oxygen oxygen intake and then the glow of fireflies huh. these are really <laughs> these are good <laughs> very well very thoughtful question they really um, are yeah uh so pollution can definitely affect fireflies um but i don't know to the extent uh the mechanics of that as far as like oxygen intake um i think what would get them first is like habitat loss, like development um, is, a, is a big factor that, that affects fireflies, um, as well as like uh, loss of this moist, like there's some species, uh, there's a particular um, threatened species in Maryland that uh, prefers just like these certain kind of marshes uh, which are being you know, drained for development. And, um, and they're, they're far more susceptible to things like that and that would probably get them before, you know, pollution. But air pollution probably does affect them as well. All right, so this one goes back to temperature range. So I believe the other question was about where they're living as far as a temperature range. But this one is more about temperature range about actually flashing. So um, is there a certain temperature range that they will flash, their parents would say they would, you know, fireflies wouldn't flash if the temperature went below 69. <laughs> huh. Yeah, so um, I believe it's around 50 degrees, but it probably also depends on um, the local habitat. So like warmer regions, they may be a little bit less tolerant to cooler temperatures, but in general, uh, I believe it's around 50 degrees. If it's above that, then you'll get some activity. Um, I've also noticed like with, uh, with some species like rain can affect them sometimes, depending on uh, if, it's, if it's like cool and rainy. Um, we do live in a, in a rainforest here, so usually they're not really that affected, but if it's like extra cold plus it rains, they often won't flash. So these next two questions talk a little bit outside of the ah, beetle circle. Yeah. Um, 
So one is, do you have bioluminescent mammals like Australia does with echidnas and platypus? I had no idea that a platypus was bioluminescent. Yeah, I think that was just recently I'm, discovered, like the last so cool. few years. It's super cool. None that I know of, but um, I would love to find a bioluminescent mammal in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know um, more about echidnas and platypuses as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you know if the bioluminescent mechanism, like you talked about the insects different enzyme versus and fungi and things, is it the same um, mechanism throughout glowing creatures? I believe it's very similar. There are some like differences in the different uh, kinds of proteins. Uh, even within fireflies that can cause a uh, slightly different color of light and things. But I think the general um, uh, uh, main protein structures are, are fairly conserved okay. as far as I understand. Let's see. And this, I believe you may have touched on in that first uh -huh. or second slide that you had talking a little bit about um, what people call fireflies. Uh -huh. Um, this person is saying that they grew up in South Central PA and they always called them lightning bugs. And mm -hmm. is that regional um, or using those names, are they different? Are they different um, insects? No, so they're the same thing. Um, they're just different names for the same thing. Yeah, like soda or pop or in Texas, we called it a Coke, no matter like what kind of Coke, a Coke. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's more, I think in general, lightning bug tends to be more Southern and firefly tends to be a little further North, but it could also be sort of urban and rural. Um, but yeah, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. I like to use fireflies because they're, I don't know, I feel like it's is easier to say, but then again, lightning bugs is about the same number of syllables. So <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, one popped in here right at the end. Um, are you familiar with the National Firefly Watch Citizen Science Program? I think it might be out of University of Massachusetts. Yeah, so I don't know a whole lot about this, but I do know that it exists and that it's a it's a really neat program. Um, uh, I wish I had more information on it, but um, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up and. Uh, listeners, if you're out there, Google National Firefly Watch, and it's a really great uh, community science program that you should definitely participate in. Great. So you could do Firefly Watch or use iNaturalist, exactly. a lot of different kind of citizen science. Or both. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and plant a native Why pick one? <laughs> <laughs> Why pick one? All right. I'm just going to check our chat real, question, yep. real quick just to see what else might have come in? Okay, so people do rear fireflies. Photinus seems to be hard to raise. I've raised Photurus uh, from small larvae. Okay, all right. So that's interesting. So you, so you can rear them, maybe just not on a mass scale like, like honeybees. Right, like honeybees. Wonderful. Oh, I, and glowworms yeah. in the cave. Sorry, I'm just- <laughs> No, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, um, the fox firefly, the Orphelia um, fungus gnat is actually uh, somewhat closely related to the glowworms that you see in, um, in New Zealand. And it's the same kind of concept where you have a fly larva that uh, spins a web and is using this light to attract food that gets caught in the web and then they eat the, eat the food that gets stuck there. Yeah, very cool. Really I'd love cool. To see them. <laughs> oh, did a question pop up while I was moving? <laughs> oh, what size? Oh, what's yeah. the size range of fireflies? Okay, so um, the blue ghosts are super tiny. That's probably the smallest species that we have around here, and they're maybe the grain of size of a grain of rice, maybe a little smaller. The the adult males. Um, wow. The females are about that, but the. Uh, I guess probably Photurus, some of the Photurus, the femme fatale species, um, are probably the biggest in our area. And they get to be maybe half an inch or so. They get pretty, can be pretty big. They're kind of 
some of them are sort of ferocious looking. <laughs> they tend to be sort of humpbacked and have these long legs and, and just look, um, have kind of an angry look on them, <laughs> on their faces. <laughs> Love it. All right. all right. Checking all our spots. Yeah. Any last minute, any things from our audience? All right. So while people may be thinking about their last moment, I'm just going to put a quick plug in. So this is our final lecture of 2021, um, but we do have our half a year um, already planned for 2022. So our next third Thursday lecture will be January 20th. It's entitled Putting Plants to Work, and it's presented by Jeff Lawrence, who's the founder of Refugia Design and Build. And it will be all about managing stormwater with your home landscape. So I know that's a problem for many people who are local to Jenkins. So tune in for some um, stormwater uh, management tips. And uh, Will, you had mentioned Doug Tallamy with Bringing Nature Home. I did want to let you guys know preview that um, our March 17th lecture will actually be given by uh, Doug Tallamy. Oh, um, awesome. And he's going to, yeah, he's going to focus on his. Um, the Nature of Oaks book. So it'll be a presentation oh, cool. um, revolving around his newest book, which is um, all about oaks. Excellent. So. That sounds great. Ooh, the two one did pop one. in here. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. What do they eat apart from each other? So um, <laughs> the adults don't really eat a whole lot mo uh, of most species anyway. They're, they're mostly just uh, maybe sipping a little bit of nectar, um, but mostly just trying to mate, lay eggs, and then they they die. Um, but the, the larvae eat, um, eat like snails and other invertebrates, soft bodied things like that. Um, yeah. Neat. Well, thanks well, so thank much. you so much for your, yeah. Thank you so much for your time tonight and your knowledge. This was awesome. Um, and thank you to everyone who's still with us out there. And this yeah. was recorded, so I will work on um, making that available for everyone. And I'll send an email out to the uh, registrants um, who joined us tonight. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thanks again, Will. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in.